Okay, continuing the theme of uh, looking at sulfides, uh, our next speaker is, how do I get out of here? There we go. Michael Carpenter, who is going to be talking about, <clears throat> where's your talk? Here we go. Yes, yeah. Uh, multiple order parameters of vacancy and magnetic order in, in pyrotide, one of the key magnetic carriers in the sulfide world. So, yeah, if you share the screen. So, okay. 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 Any other? Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Richard for in allowing me to contribute to this meeting. Uh, when he referred in the introduction to crusty old professors, I think he had <laughs> me in mind. Um, my interest has largely been in the physics of these materials rather than in the uh, paleomagnetics and geology and so on. Uh, but uh, it seems to me, that having listened to what you've all been saying, some of it might be relevant. So what I'm going to talk about is some work that was done uh, on a Leverhulme grant, mainly by um, uh, postdoc Seb Haynes. It's published in the physics literature a few years ago, um, but uh, uh, unlikely, I think, that you would have come across it if you're reading only its geological literature. So uh, pyrotite is, uh, uh, everyone refers to pyrotite, actually, it's a very complicated system. Most people think pyrotite is Fe7S8, but the solid solution is between troilite, FeS, and uh, roughly FeS, uh, Fe7S8. And uh, within that solid solution, you have all these different structures, uh, 2C, 3C, 4C, and so on. That's just the repeat in the C direction associated with the way the vacancies order. So it's a vacancy solid solution. And uh, super, superimposed on that, you've got uh, magnetic transitions, paramagnetic, uh, above uh, 590k, uh, antiferromagnetic on the left-hand side and ferrimagnetic on the right-hand side. And there's this spin-flop transition, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, uh, quite a bit um, uh, in FES. And of course, in pyrotype, there's also the Besnes transition at 33 Kelvin. So uh, this is of interest from, a, obviously, what all the things you, you all work on, but it's also interest in a... Um, more um, a different field in um, functional materials because functional materials you want multiple instabilities basically and in this case you've got uh, magnetism and vacancy ordering you've got possibilities of controlling the properties of your sample and uh, to address that uh, the physics of it at least you first have to consider the structure type so it's a nickel arsenide structure the repeat is 1c here in Fe7S8, you take out one iron and put in a vacancy and order it, you get the 4C uh, structure. And this is on a clinic and the other structures, uh, according to your stoichiometry, is you're gonna get different ordering schemes. So in addition though, uh, uh, which attracted my interest actually was the magnetism. And you can describe the different magnetic structures in terms of the different um, uh, uh, representations for the different ordering schemes. The only two relevant here, one is this M gamma four plus, where the moment is, is parallel to O1, and this M gamma five plus, uh, where it's uh, 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 perpendicular to the 100 plane. So you have, uh, well, we'll see, uh, you have a, 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 a flop between the two orientations. And um, if we want to uh, understand how that magnetism interacts with the uh, vacancy ordering, you basically have to do group theory, which I don't want to uh, immerse uh, you in. In fact, you don't want to be immersed in it either. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it's a simple way of uh, characterizing how these things interact on a fundamental scale. And there's no choice. Group theory is group theory. They can't behave any differently. And the vacancy ordering schemes, uh, this is a pre one zone, uh, typical space. The only thing is that the uh, different vacancy ordering schemes here, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, even you can see they're all related along this line between the L point and the M point. And it doesn't matter more than that. They're all uh, closely related uh, by symmetry. And the magnetic ordering, uh, for those who are physicists, is always associated with uh, the gamma point. So we've got to interact um, magnetic order parameters 
with these um, uh, order parameters on the U line. And uh, again, I don't want to immerse you in it, but you should be aware <laughs> that uh, behind all this is uh, a Landau theory. And basically we understand the stability of these things in terms of the contribution of magnetic ordering, uh, vacancy ordering, coupling between those orderings, coupling between magnetism and strain, E I'm going to use a strain, between vacancy ordering and strain, and, uh, and so on, and we have a Hooke's law elastic energy. And you can write out all those, those terms and describe at a fundamental level how these things uh, interact. So more practically, uh, uh, kind of things one does on magnetometers and so on, uh, Troilite has a, um, a paramagnetic above 590K, it has a spin flop transition at 450K, and uh, both of those are antiferromagnetic. So it goes from this M gamma five plus scheme to the M gamma four plus scheme, spin flops, first order, there's no group subgroup relationships. And again, we have to dip into the group theory, understand how could that magnetism affect the cation vacancy ordering. So we have to do the formality of the group theory where we assign an order parameter for the vacancy ordering. This is on this U line, uh, for Fe7S8 and a magnetic order parameter here. And I'll just draw your attention to here's the uh, U order parameter, and here is the um, magnetic order parameter. And if we go, that's the monoclinic structure. And if we go through the business transition, you see the differences we gain here an additional uh, component for the magnetic ordering. So to cut a long story short, uh, in red here, the, the cation vacancy ordering makes it go monoclinic. Uh, in troilite, it's um, it's orthrhombic, so uh, uh, yes, and it, it doesn't it doesn't have a monoclinic uh, symmetry change. The cation vacancy therefore allows, instead of having a spin flop transition, that allows the the moments to go continuously from this plane to n gamma five plus to n gamma four plus because it's already broken the symmetry. And then the Bessel's transition allows another break in symmetry and another rotation. Of the, uh, uh, of the moments. So back to things that will be more familiar. Um, let's look at FES and FE7S8. So on the left-hand side here, I've got the square of the ordering, uh, uh, order, a magnetic order parameter for FES. And on the right, I've got FE7S8 and you scale them so you see they're identical. So the ordering in FE7S8 is no different from that ordering in FES. If you do the same for the lattice parameters, here's A, uh, uh, volume, and C, essentially the same. So we have a significant coupling of the magnetic order parameter with strain, we get a lattice a distortion. In FES and FE7S8, it's basically the same. The other thing about FE7S8, which uh, I was curious about, is how closely does the cation vacancy ordering couple with the magnetic ordering. Uh, do they have separate transition temperatures or are they identical? Turns out it's identical. You can't separate them. So here we've got the vacancy ordering order parameter, which I've uh, extracted from uh, the monoclinic angle. And on the right, we've got the magnetic order parameter. So the blue is magnetic ordering and the red is uh, vacancy ordering. And you see they have exactly the same uh, transition temperature. These are very strongly coupled uh, um, and you can't have one uh, without the other. If we go on to look at the, um, uh, the business transition and the rotation, so below 300 Kelvin, uh, this is a, uh, I should have said we'd be, we were using a nice uh, crystal of Fe7S8 from uh, Brazil, so a really good uh, a single crystal. And we measured the, the magnetic moment to different orientations. And uh, uh, there are, I, you can see what they are here, the three different orientations, orthogonal, and uh, you can see that the uh, moments rotate continuously from 300 Kelvin down to the Bessel's transition. This uh, the orientation of the moment is changing. Uh, instead of the spin flop, it's already uh, monoclinic, so it's allowed to do that continuously. And then the Bessel's transition, it um, uh, jumps, well, it goes continuously to a new orientation. And we can see this most clearly in the um, stereogram here. Here's room temperature. The moment uh, 
goes along this plane tilting out and then the business transition, it jumps out and uh, goes in this other orientation. And it did occur to me as uh, you were all talking about meteorites, I guess the uh, temperature a meteorite is at uh, for what, 4.5 billion years is about, I don't know, less than one Kelvin or something. So all the old meteorites have spent most of their lives within the stability field of the business uh, state. And um, whether that makes any difference or not, I don't know. But um, certainly um, uh, it's not the state that you would expect to see at room temperature. Um, the business transition requires that you have symmetry breaking and actually goes triclinic, but you can't measure distortion. There's not a big enough uh, distortion to measure by X-ray diffraction. So what you can do instead is to measure elastic properties, which we do routinely here with so-called resonant ultrasound spectroscopy, which is like ringing a bell. You think of a bell, it rings with a frequency. If you change the, the density of the bell, you'll change the frequency, of, or change the shape, you'll change the frequency uh, of the resonance. So here's a crystal of uh, um, Fe7S8, a resonant frequency, 60 Kelvin. As we cool down, uh, we see a, a distinct anomaly in frequency and a distinct anomaly in the, the width of these uh, peaks. So we've got a significant elastic anomaly associated with business transition, and, uh, but it's very small. This is a tiny effect. So the high temperature transition in pyrotite is very strongly coupled with strain, and the business transition is very weakly magnetoelastic. So the other thing that, again, you're interested in, and also the functional materials are interested in, is microstructure. And uh, these are, this is an image of our crystal taken by a student in Warwick, uh, Sam Seddon. It's magnetic force microscopy, scales uh, 20 microns here, and you can see these dark black bands uh, a twin, ferroelastic twins, the different monoclinic orientations. Uh, the black is one orientation and those orangey purple are the other. And then you can also see the um, uh, magnetic domains. So it's antiferromagnetic, except that one of the vacancies is on, uh, the vacancies are on one of the sublattices, so it becomes a ferrimagnetic and we get the um, uh, uh, magnetic domain structure. Now the functional materials people, are interested in the properties, not of the domains, but the domain walls, because if you could devise, if you could make a device which depended on the properties of the domain wall, you really reduce the scale of your device massively. So nanoscale of devices. And so uh, we've been interested in what happens on the domain walls. And there's an odd thing about the Besnitz transition, which we noticed when you measure the heat capacity. So here's 33 Kelvin, uh, the transition uh, measured at different fields, field strengths, and you can see it's not a single transition. And in fact, you can pick out probably three, uh, um, three, three of these, uh, three different peaks here, um, at least uh, through the transition. And the, the suspicion is that the magnetic properties of the domain walls are significantly different from the magnetic properties of the domains. And a ferroelastic domain is, a, is a, a region a few units cell thick of massive shear strain uh, gradient. There's a big shear strain in these structures and also a, a significant change in the vacancy ordering scheme across the domain walls. So you would expect the domain walls to have different magnetic properties. And that's our suspicion, although we haven't uh, um, taken it any further than that. So we can now go back to the phase diagram uh, and rationalize it, all these phases in terms of the two uh, uh, behaviors, the magnetic ordering and the um, uh, uh, vacancy ordering different schemes. Uh, the only thing I really want to draw your attention to here, which seems to me to be one of the really uh, interesting features of pyrotide, is the fact that I've shown my red uh, marker there, the uh, nail temperature is the same, 590K all across the solid solution. Never mind you're changing the stoichiometry and you're having all sorts of different ordering schemes and so on and so on, that nail temperature stays the same. And that tells us that the magnetic ordering determines everything else. So you have a magnetic ordering transition and it's so strongly coupled with the strain that immediately you've got to have cation ordering, a vacancy ordering, and that vacancy ordering has to adapt to whatever the magnetic uh, structure is. And you, uh, according to also the stoichiometry. 
So it's, a, it's an odd system. Normally you would expect that you change the vacancy ordering, you change the magnetism, but actually it's the other way around. Uh, so brings me to my last slide here because I said my interest is really uh, in background of functional materials. And this is a kind of diagram you wouldn't see as a geologist, but you would see all the time at a, a, a materials physics meeting. And they're Venn diagrams showing uh, here's a, a circle for a ferromagnetic material, a circle for, anti, uh, for a ferroelectric, a ferroelastic, and a superconductor, and so on. You can add, add any property you like. And the interesting thing from the materials people point of view is where they overlap. So in here, any material which is both magnetic and ferroelectric, you can manipulate the ferroelectric properties of the magnetic field and so on. From my point of view, the only thing that matters is it doesn't matter how many properties you add, they always overlap with strain. So your strain field here will always overlap with everything. It doesn't matter you've got mag magnetic ordering, vacancy ordering, whatever it is, you will induce a strain. And that matters in these multiple instability materials because each of your order parameters, Q, can couple with a strain. The form of it will depend on group theory. But if you've got two order parameters, each couples with a strain, they couple with each other. And that's exactly what happens in FE7S8. And um, the holy grail for the, the um, uh, uh, device material people is they would like to find a material which is ferroelastic and has ferro, ferro or ferrimagnetic domain walls, because then you can read and write the magnetic uh, uh, memory on the domain walls. This is actually very close because the but the domains, instead of in FE7S8, the domains are antiferromagnetic in principle, but with this very magnetic component. Um, but that is uh, uh, what they're after. Uh, what I'm very interested in, what you've all been saying about the uh, ferrotite in meteorites, is what's the stoichiometry and what's the microstructure? So if you've got, have you got ferroelastic domain walls, how will they affect the magnetic properties? So I don't know, I don't know if you even know the uh, stoichiometry, but uh, in principle, uh, the microstructure is very important and we know how to deal with the coupling of the magnetism uh, with the structure. Thank you. We get a chance in a second. Any other questions? That was, if, if not, I was going to ask some of our meteorite experts, of which I am not one, what the temperature, what are the temperatures of meteorites between ex when they're, you know, excavated from their parent body before they land? About 200 Kelvin. 200. Yeah, same reason that the surface of the moon and the surface of Mars and the surface of bodies in atmospheres is controlled entirely by the distance from the sun. So that, that's not an issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the constant is for Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah not necessarily. Yeah. Good. So then the word of the way transition either. Not unless they come from very far. What's the rule? Okay. Uh, when do you want to come? You guys. Ah, yeah. If you don't mind. So, Michael, and really nice talk. I just wanted to make sure. I, uh, maybe I misunderstood something. So uh, in uh, pyrotype, for example, then where you very commonly have these uh, magnetic domain walls, uh, are you saying that they will be significantly influenced by uh, um, magnetoelastic strain? Uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 indeed. So, yeah, indeed. Right, so that then will increase the stability of those domain walls. Uh, yes, indeed. So you would expect a yeah. pyrotype to have very, very stable uh, magnetic domain uh, structure because it's so strongly coupled with the strain. Uh, right. Whereas uh, below the Besant's transition uh, should also have very elastic domain walls, but it really should be able to wander off at will. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. Something I've not put into my models, but clearly uh, I need to. The, the thing is the strain is coming from the vacancy ordering. So once you've ordered the vacancies, that's it. Okay. You're, you're, you can't do much more to it because that's okay. good. The... I, I, need to, I clearly need to come and talk to you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you, Michael.